When I think about the Attitude Era, there's a lot to like about that period of wrestling. A lot of things about the Attitude Era that people like to romanticize. The Brawl for All is not one of them. And that was the subject of Dark Side of the Ring on Vice this past week. After a couple of disturbing episodes on Chris Benoit and New Jack, they lightened the mood a little bit and talked about the infamous Brawl for All tournament that took place on Monday Night Raw from June to August of 1998. They also gave us Jim Cornette versus Vince Russo, part two. Part one was the Montreal Screwjob episode from season one, where both men took credit for coming up with the double cross idea. Cornette explained in detail where he got the idea from, which was an earlier Montreal Screwjob back in the 1930s and then swore on the life of his mother and his dog that he was telling the truth, while Russo said, no, no, bro, 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 it was me, bro. Okay, bro, I came up with the idea, bro. That was all me. I screwed Bret Hart. I hate it, bro. I hate that it had to happen, but bro, it was me. I don't know what Jim Cornette is even talking about, bro. I had to dust off my Russo there. The producers, they know what they're doing. Right? They know it makes for great television to pit Russo against Cornette, even though both men come off horribly. Cornette makes, he, look, Cornette makes valid points, and, and clearly he's very passionate about this. His passion is real. His passion is genuine. It shines through in a lot of what he says. But when you threaten to kill another man's family because you have a professional disagreement with him, you are unhinged. It can be very entertaining, don't get me wrong. But you cross a line when you do that, right? You're almost 60 years old, dude. Act like it. So they each took credit for the Montreal screw job, but Cornette is, is more than happy to give Russo all the credit for the Brawl for All. And Russo happily takes credit for coming up with it, although by the end of the episode, he does uh, seem to have some regrets as he's watching it back, in light of what we know now about concussions and CTE, you know, I love all these wrestlers and these wrestling promoters and these wrestling writers and personalities. And Russo is not the only one. I've heard Tommy Dreamer talk about that. A lot of people talk about this. Oh, we didn't know. We didn't know. You know, in light of what we know now, and look, I get that CTE is a term that nobody even knew, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, didn't exist. You know, but do you really need the benefit of hindsight to know that getting hit repeatedly dead on in the fucking skull with a steel chair probably isn't a good idea? Oh, we didn't know. Who knew? Who could have known back then that getting hit full force in the head with a chair might cause concussions and might scramble people's brains? Yeah, who knew? So they go all the way back here at the beginning of this episode. And Russo was talking about that period in the mid-90s in WWE, you know, when he, basically around the time he would have taken over as the head writer. They had just gone through this period with these awful characters. They talked about the goon and T.L. Hopper, and they talked about and had footage of Mantar. Half man, half tar, I guess. Whereas Vince McMahon said, half man, half beast. I say half man, half tar. And so Russo thought that, you know, this is terrible. These characters are shit. This is not the direction that the company should be going in. They People wanted more of a behind-the-scenes look. They wanted more realism in the product. And, of course, then they show Jim Cornette. And Jim Cornette, he despises when people use the word fake. He, he must not be a fan this week of Ronda Rousey, I guess. I'll talk about her later. But uh, to him, of course, nothing fake about the abuse that these guys put their bodies through. And he's going, you know, on his usual spiel. And Cornette's talking about Vince McMahon. He says, look, WWE is all that Vince McMahon knows. It's, it's his life. He doubts that he's been to the grocery store or seen a movie in the last 40 years. Not true. Not true. I remember reading that when There's Something About Mary came out, okay, with Ben Stiller and Cameron Diaz, whatever year that was, probably right, right around the Attitude Era, right around this time. Uh, might have been that year, in fact. Might have been 98 when that movie came out. 
it's like one of his favorite movies. I don't know if Vince went to an actual movie theater. I don't know if Vince has a movie theater in his home. I don't know if somebody brought him the movie. <laughs> I don't know if he paid the actors to reenact the movie for him right in front of him. I don't know. But I I had read that back then. I've, I've seen it mentioned since that there's something about Mary is like one of his favorite movies. So there's at least one movie, I guess other than The Chaperone, that Vince McMahon has watched in the last 40 years. But Cornette had this great line. He said, Vince McMahon is a genius and a demon. Sadly, he's more demon than genius these days. Uh, Russo told the story of getting the call to come to Vince McMahon's office, and he thought he was going to be fired. You know, he was writing for the magazine, Raw Magazine, at that time. And he walks in, and Vince has all of his minions in the room with him. Jim Ross is there, Pat Patterson, Bruce Pritchard, Jim Cornette. They're all in there. And... Vince had a copy of the Raw magazine on the desk. He slammed it down on the desk, and he said, this is what the product needs to be on TV. And from that point on, Vince Russo became the head writer for WWE. And Cornette, of course, he thought Russo was a goof, and all he wanted to do was turn wrestling into the Jerry Springer show. And Russo admits, he says, look, I, bro, I would literally sit there, bro. And write the shows with Jerry Springer on in the background. He would write the shows with Jerry Springer on in the background. Russo said he was writing for college kids that would get together every Monday night. Remember WCW Monday Nitro used to have the Nitro parties? So Russo was trying to write for the college demographic. He was trying to grab the casual viewer. So how did the Brawl for All come about? How did this idea get willed into existence. For that, you can thank Vince Russo, and according to Russo, you can thank JBL. Russo made it very clear. He admitted, he goes, I didn't like JBL. I thought he was this loud-mouthed bully. He was very obnoxious. He would always talk, you know, about how tough he was or act all tough. And he said backstage one day in the locker room, he overheard JBL and his, his big mouth in the back telling everybody that if this were real, I would beat everybody's ass. Unless their name is Joey Styles. JBL cannot beat Joey Styles. So Russo hears this, he's bothered by this, and he goes to Vince McMahon and conceives, I guess, of this idea of the brawl. For now, this is Russo's version of events, so take it with a grain of salt. This is how he explains how the whole idea came to be. He went to Vince McMahon with this idea, and Vince McMahon approved it. So then we're introduced to Bart Gunn, the winner of the Brawl for All. They interviewed him here for the episode. And Bart Gunn, you know, he was one half of the smoking guns. He had been split up from Billy. Billy had moved on by this point. You know, he was doing the DX thing, the New Age Outlaws. He was a bigger star than Bart. Bart's career was just kind of fizzling out. You know, he was doing this NWA revival thing of the Midnight Express, Bodacious Bart and Bombastic Bob or whatever the whatever the fuck their names were. So Bruce Pritchard, he, he approaches Bart one day with this idea. Hey, we got this idea for this thing called the Brawl for All. And he thought it was dumb. Until Kevin Kelly had a conversation with him and he explained that the winner would get, I think it was $100,000. Jericho in the episode, he claimed it was $75,000. Because uh, Jericho does the narration for all these episodes, he claimed it was seventy-five k. Uh, Bob Holly in his book said that they were told it was a hundred grand. Point is, they would get a big payoff, and on top of the money, they would get a run with Steve Austin for the championship. So the idea of getting a run with the top guy and making top pay that was too good for Bart to say no to. So he said, "Sure, I'll be part of it." Now Russo says he thought the Godfather was probably the toughest guy in the locker room. They interviewed the Godfather. Godfather always looks happy. Godfather, I love Godfather. Godfather always has a smile on his face. <laughs> He's living life. He retired. He does the cameos every now and then, or like a surprise Royal Rumble appearance. But otherwise, he's happily retired. He's running his business. He's got his Cheetahs Club out there in Vegas. He's around all the beautiful women. This guy is living large. So they interview Charles Wright. They run through all of his various gimmicks. This episode was already a winner. At this point, we had mentions of Mantar and Papa Shango on this episode. We're only like barely 10 minutes in. But he admits, he says, the Godfather was his favorite of all the characters. I'm sure it was. <laughs> I'm sure it was. He goes, 
my favorite of all the characters, in his words, he goes, selling white girls. That was my gimmick on TV, and he loved it. When he left wrestling, as I said, he's, I believe he's still running that uh, Cheetahs Club out there in Vegas. They interviewed Darren Drozdov for the episode. I didn't expect to see Droz on here, but they interviewed Droz. Uh, he's still wheelchair-bound after all these years, but he seems to be, you know, otherwise healthy and happy and in good spirits. Uh, good sense of humor about all this stuff. They even showed the clip from Beyond the Mat when Vince McMahon met him for the first time. From, uh, you know, he's gonna puke! He's gonna puke! I always turn away when they show that, but they had uh, they had the whole segment. They showed the whole clip. So Jim Ross is also interviewed for this. I don't know why Jim Ross always comes across as being very pissed off. Very, very, um, very annoyed when they've interviewed him for these episodes so far. Uh, maybe they got him on a bad day. I don't know. But Jim Ross is talking about this and... You know, he didn't shut the idea down in his mind right away uh, because, as he said, you don't know how it's going to go until you try it. And they aired a clip from Bruce Pritchard's podcast. They interviewed Pritchard uh, last season for the show, but obviously now, with him being in WWE, uh, I guess they couldn't interview him directly. But they played a clip from his podcast with Conrad of him talking about the Brawl for All and explaining how the... Uh, the matches were made. It was totally random. He says, we had a brown paper bag. Savio Vega reached in and drew the names. And that's how the brackets were supposedly chosen. They were supposedly chosen at random. Now, the Brawl for All rules. It was three one-minute rounds. You get five points for the most punches landed in a round. A takedown is good for five points. Knockdowns were ten points. And a knockout would obviously end the fight. So then we get to the participants. We had Bradshaw, who, remember, according to Vince Russo, the whole reason behind this entire tournament even happening was Bradshaw and his big mouth. So Bradshaw's in there. Mark Merrow, who was a, a legit Golden Gloves boxing champion early in his career. This guy could this guy could throw down. Mark Canterbury, the former Henry Godwin, Henry O. Godwin, he was in there. Savio Vega. Brackus, remember Brackus, 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 who gives a shit? He, he never he never went anywhere. He was in there. Road Warrior Hawk, Draz, Pierre Ouellette, who has one eye. They put a one-eyed man in this, a PCO. They put a one-eyed PCO in this tournament, which tells you the wisdom of the people who worked there. The Godfather, Dan the Beast Severn who dropped out after his first round win because he said he had nothing left to prove. He thought it would it would damage his reputation being a part of this. And also because he had already cashed the bonus check that they had given him for agreeing to even participate in the tournament. <laughs> once that check was uh, cleared, once that check was cashed, he wisely cashed out his chips and said goodbye. Uh, Two Cold Scorpio, he was in there. Not a guy that uh, I'd want to mess with. Eight Ball. From DOA, Bob Holly, Bart Gunn, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, who had signed with WWE months earlier and wrestled exactly one dark match up to that point. He wrestled a dark match in April of 98 against uh, Too Cold Scorpio. Vince McMahon even introduced him to the ring for it. And he did not debut in the ring on TV until the Brawl for All with the expectation that he would win the entire thing and he was then going to be groomed for a program with uh, the other Steve Williams. That was Steve Austin's real name at the time. I believe Austin has legally changed his name since then, since he retired. He is now legally Steve Austin. Uh, but he too was also Steve Williams back then. And Steve Blackman was also in the tournament. I could see why Vince McMahon wanted uh, Steven Regal to change his name to William. Later on, there were a lot of Steves in this company at that time. Steve Austin, Steve Williams, Steve Blackman, Stephen Regal. So in his book, The Hardcore Truth, which I highly recommend, Bob Holly said that as soon as Blackman found out that he was in the tournament, he started training for it. And he was dead serious about hurting people for that $100,000 that the winner was promised. He was going to take out their knees. Blackman told him, I'm going to take out their knees and I'm going to win that money. 
So one day they're all gathered in the back for a meeting. And I don't know who was leading the meeting, if it was Vince, if it was Bruce Pritchard, or who, who it would have been, I don't know. But the rules were being explained to all of the all the guys. And they were told, anything goes. Those are the original rules. There were no rules. Anything goes. I, maybe you can't use a weapon, but otherwise there really were no rules. And Blackman, he says, so that means that if I want to take out somebody's knee with a kick, I can do it, right? And that's when the Einsteins in WWE management realized, you know what? We may have to have some rules for this thing. We may, we may have to set down some ground rules for this tournament. And Bob Holly thinks they were legit worried that Blackman might kill some people. So they were originally going to go with more of this sort of MMA uh, kickboxing hybrid for the rules. But thanks to Steve Blackman, the rules got changed. And it was very interesting to get Holly's perspective in his book about the whole Dr. Death thing. Because you can tell that Jim Ross gets very irritated when people talk about how, oh, JR was upset because his boy got knocked out. Right? He's always very upset when people say that. Holly said that it was obvious that they had Dr. Death earmarked to win the entire thing and to get the program with Steve Austin. And a lot of the boys in the back were very irritated by how much Jim Ross was putting over Dr. Death all the time in the back, talking about how he was going to destroy everybody. He says JR put him over so much that the other talent resented him for it. They resented Dr. Death, and he didn't do nothing wrong. They were hoping that Dr. Death would get knocked out because Jim Ross would not shut up about this guy. Now, on the Vice special, JR says there was no covert plan. Everybody just needs to grow up. That's what Jim Ross said. Everybody needs to grow up. Bart said that he doesn't believe for a second that the pairings were made randomly out of a brown paper bag as uh, Bruce Pritchard claims, because it just so happened. It just so happened that he ended up facing Bob Holly, who was his tag team partner at the time. Bart and Bob were being matched up in the tournament. And Holly in his book said that when he fought Bart, he had never been hit so hard in his life as he was hit by Bart Gunn. And he was convinced they were fixing this thing for Dr. Death to win. Even, even in his match with Pierre, the match that Dr. Death had with Pierre, the one-eyed man, Dr. Death, he didn't look that great. He didn't look great. And he thought that they were gimmicking the scores, the judges' scores, to make it look like he had dominated him. When if you watch the fight back, it was hardly, you know, a, a domination. As the fight was happening with Bart and with Dr. Death, even though Bart kind of owned him in the second round. Williams was ahead on points on all the scorecards. So all the boys in the back were getting pissed because they're all crowding around the monitor watching this thing. And they're getting increasingly pissed off because they knew Bart was going to lose. Unless he knocked, unless he could knock him out, they knew that no matter what, Bart was going to lose. That the fix was in and Bart was going to lose. So when he finally dropped him, he said, Holly said that there was a good 60 people in the back crowding around that monitor who blew the roof off the place. They popped so hard when Dr. Death went down, when he got knocked out. And Terry Funk was there. Terry Funk was working for WWE at the time, Chainsaw Charlie. Terry Funk was there. He was really upset when that happened because he felt that all the boys who were popping and celebrating and everything, he felt they were disrespecting Dr. Death. You know, Dr. Death had uh had a lot of respect in his book for his work in Japan and 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 he probably knew him for a number of years so he actually was very upset by that he felt they were disrespecting Steve and Holly said you know he goes look they didn't pop because they hated Steve they popped because they knew the judges were fucking around with the scores and they had this thing rigged for him to win here they're telling these guys on the one hand that this thing is a shoot and on the other, they're trying to fix the outcome to suit their own plans. So they meant no disrespect to Steve Williams. And Holly said that his suspicions were confirmed uh, that night when they dragged Dr. Death to the back after he got knocked out. They dragged him to the back. He had a, a dislocated jaw. He had a torn hamstring. He really hurt his leg pretty badly. And he claims, this is Holly's claim, that he heard Steve telling the guys, I guess the, the medics or whoever was working on him, the trainers, the doctors, 
he overheard Williams telling them, he goes, I don't know what they're going to do now. They already paid me the money to win this thing. He says JR after that was furious for weeks and he couldn't believe that they had already paid him the prize money before he even won the tournament. Now, in theory, the idea of Dr. Death mowing through guys in the tournament, becoming Vince McMahon's henchman, which I believe was the plan, and then feuding with Stone Cold, it's not a terrible idea, right? He got hurt, so when he came back in 99, he was with JR in the angle where JR came back from Bell's Palsy. He was a heel, he had his own little announce table. I mean, we went through that little phase where Jim Ross was a heel for a few weeks. And then they just sort of forgot about it. Uh, Williams did an interview that year after he got released from the company. Dr. Death did an interview. I think it was a radio interview in 99. The audio is online. I went back and I listened to it. This was after he was released and he claimed that he was promised the push that Triple H ultimately ended up getting that year. That was meant for him. But then he got released. So the angle where Triple H beat up Jim Ross on TV and, and broke his arm or threatened to break his arm... Uh, which came later in the year, he claimed that that was going to be him, that he was going to turn on Jim Ross and go heel, become the big heel, and finally get that program with Steve Austin. Now, of course, Austin ended up having to bow out about a month or two later after that because he had to get neck surgery. That's when he went to go have the spinal fusion. So it's interesting to look back. There's a lot of what-if questions here, right? Would we have even gotten that program at all if Austin was that hurt and he was going to be leaving anyway? Would they would they have even been able to get the program in between Stone Cold and Dr. Death? Maybe not. Or if Austin had, had to leave and was he the champion at the time? He wasn't. No, Austin wasn't the champion. I was going to say, if he was the champion, would they have just gotten the belt onto Dr. Death? But uh, Austin, I don't believe Austin was... Uh, the champion at that time. He had actually lost the title to Triple H. So th there's a lot of questions about what would have happened if, if what, you know, Williams is saying is accurate, that he was going to uh, get the, the push that, from what he saw on TV, Triple H, hey, that would have been me. All the things I see Triple H doing, that's what they told me they were going to do with me. How different things might have been. You know, we'll never know. Things happen for a reason. I think things worked out for the better on all fronts here. If Dr. Death, wins the brawl for all, and does not get hurt, if he doesn't get injured and he wins the whole thing, and he gets his program with Steve Austin in late 98, then he ends up taking the spot that went to The Rock. It delays The Rock's big push, which is asinine to even think about. That was when The Rock went heel, he joined the corporation, that was one of my favorite incarnations of The Rock, and it was a big part, I think, of the growth of that Rock character was that late 98, early 99 period. The matches with Mankind. I mean, I could have done without him bludgeoning Mick Foley half to death at the Royal Rumble. But, you know, Foley getting the big championship win on Raw at the beginning of 99. You know, all, all of that stuff. It never would have happened, possibly, had Dr. Death gotten that spot instead. It's amazing to think about how different history would be. And maybe how different The Rock's career would have been. Or if Dr. Death instead, you know, he comes back in 99 from his injury, he's all healed up, and he's groomed for a program in 99 with Austin, the one that Triple H ended up getting, or the big push that Triple H ended up getting, then maybe Triple H doesn't get that spot, or Triple H's push is delayed. You know, Rock and Triple H were two of the biggest rising stars, the two big rising young stars in the company at that time. And one or both of their pushes could have been derailed by one for Dr. Death, who was probably past his physical prime at that point. I mean, Dr. Death at that point was almost 40 years old. Austin, when he went down with the neck, thank God that WWE had Triple H that was already being pushed in The Rock. Triple H and The Rock were the two guys who carried the company on their shoulders in 2000 until Austin came back. So, I mean, it's it's it is one of those things that's incredible to look back on and say holy shit you know boy i think things worked out for the better i think things worked out for wwe a hell of a lot better the way that it ended up happening now russo said everybody in the back was stunned when bark gun knocked out the godfather godfather beat up people for a living at his club you know the pimps who would come into the bar and he'd tell them to leave and if they didn't 
He'd rough him up. I mean, that's what this guy did for a living. And so it was shocking when he got knocked out. Godfather was great here. He, he admitted, he goes, all I did before each fight was smoke weed. That's all I did. That was my pre-fight ritual. He said his wife was pissed at him when he got knocked out because she blamed the weed for them not getting all that money. <laughs> she was very upset that he didn't get the, uh, the, the hundred grand. So then we get to the finals. The finals are set. Bart Gunn against Bradshaw. Bart Gunn knocks Bradshaw down. Bradshaw's loopy. He's spaghetti-legged. He's not all there. Somehow he gets back up to his feet, and he gets dropped. I mean, he gets just absolutely walloped. Right in the head, he falls down. Cornette said it was scary. You could see the guy wasn't all there. Bradshaw, when it was over, he says, very scary. Russo admitted, he goes, bro, <laughs> he could hardly contain himself. He was so happy because the whole point was to put Bradshaw in his place. That's all he wanted to do from the moment that the tournament was conceived of, and he got exactly what he wanted. All the other damage it did, all the other injuries be damned, Vince Russo got to see Bradshaw get his comeuppance. And Cornette is annoyed to this very day because Russo, he says, still doesn't get it. He does not realize, he doesn't understand what he did wrong. He calls Russo a skid mark on the underwear of life. And Russo says that one day he checks the messages on his answering machine. And he's got this cuss-filled tirade waiting for him on his answering machine from Jim Cornette. He can't believe that somebody would be this upset over wrestling. He says, bro, bro, I can't understand, bro. How could somebody be this upset? It's wrestling, bro. It's just wrestling. How could somebody be upset over wrestling, bro? He can't understand it. He can't understand it. And then came the mother of all voicemails. Now, again, Russo said Cornette left this message for him. Cornette was, this is the one where supposedly Cornette threatened to kill him and his family. Uh, Cornette was very happy to repeat what he remembers telling Vince Russo, as only Jim Cornette can do. He says, he told him, I would just like to tell you, you no good piece of shit, you motherfucker, what a piece of shit you are, and how you narrowly escaped being put in a fucking hospital by me with a damn baseball bat for all you've done to me, my friends, and the careers you've ruined and the shitty wrestling you've produced. I just wanted to make sure you knew that from my own lips. Cornette says wrestling has been the most important thing in his life. Therein lies the problem, I think. It's all he knows. I don't even know if Jim Cornette has any other hobbies. His whole life has been wrestling, so of course he takes it seriously. If there's a perceived threat to it, he goes off on people, and he takes it too far. The things he says, he takes it way too far. That's why he's been uh, you know, ostracized the way that he has. Opportunity after opportunity, WWE, TNA, Ring of Honor, NWA, Nothing but controversy. Everywhere he's been. Nothing but... Think of the way he got fired by WWE. Think of the issues he had in TNA. Look at how his run ended in Ring of Honor. Look at what happened in the NWA. The things I was told about that. At some point, you look at the situation and you say to yourself, what's the constant involved here? Is it really always just the fault of the promotion? Or is it the one guy who continues to bounce around from place to place and leave on the worst possible terms? Or is it not possible that it could be Cornette himself? So Bart wins. The man that they did not expect to win has now won. So what did they do? They sent him home. They sent him home because they had no plans for him. Until months later, Vince McMahon got the idea to have him fight Butterbean at WrestleMania 15. Butterbean had already fought in the WWF before. He had had what they build a, a tough man contest for commission reasons. I guess they had to call it a tough man contest at uh, the DX In Your House pay-per-view in December of 97. He had a, a fight with Mark Merrow, what I assume was a worked fight, mostly worked fight. So Butterbean had already worked with them once before. And I think he may, I think the story is that he may have had two fights or two matches on his contract with WWE. So he had the one at the end of 97. He had this other one that 
you know, he may have still had a contract with them and like Ronda Rousey, right? Ronda Rousey hasn't been seen on television in a year, over a year, but she's still under contract to WWE through April of 2021. So maybe Butterbean had a similar deal, two fights. We, we did one. He's under contract. It's time to use him for fight number two, which was the Bart Gunn fight. They interviewed Butterbean here on this special. He flat out said that he was Bart's punishment, which I think everybody kind of already knew. But he said the same thing. I was basically the punishment for this guy. And Godfather says he can remember sitting around one day. He was smoking weed, of course. Of course he was. It was him, Gilberg, and Butterbean. He didn't say Butterbean was smoking, but he said it was him and Gilberg. They were, they were, they were lighting up. It was Godfather, Gilberg, and Butterbean. It is the faction that I never thought I wanted, but now I am so sad we never got. He said, Butterbean told him, he said, look, I, I know you guys are tough. I know you guys are tough and all, but I'm going to knock this guy out. I'm going to knock this man out. It is two different sports. He has no chance against me. And Butterbean says, you know, as he was about to walk through the curtain that night in Philly at WrestleMania, Vince smiled at him. And he knew then that Vince knew exactly what was about to happen to Bart Gunn when Vince smiled. And what he did to Bart was he nearly knocked his head off his shoulders into the fifth row. They replayed the the fight here, all uh, 27 seconds of it. It was terrifying. That last shot, that, that, that kind of death blow that he got in on Bart Gunn at the end, where he just, I mean, he knocked this guy into the middle of, forget next week, he knocked this guy into the middle of next year. It was terrifying to watch that back. Butterbean said that his kids were so upset because their friends told them, I guess maybe at school the next day, they, <laughs> his kids' friends told them that their dad had killed a man on pay-per-view. You know, and look, Butterbean says he thinks Bart had a 50-50 shot if he would have brawled the way that he did with all the other wrestlers, but instead he had it in his head that he had a box. He was training for a boxing match. And he said the second that Bart tried to box with him, it was all over. Now, after he was released, which wasn't very long after that, Bart went to Japan. He wrestled in Japan. In fact, uh, he was actually tag team partners with Johnny Ace for a while. And he did well in Japan. He gained a lot of cred over in Japan for knocking out Dr. Death because Dr. Death was such a revered, well-respected name in Japan for so many years. So him knocking out Dr. Death actually gave him a lot of credibility with the fans over there. So Bart, you know, Bart did well. Uh, they did not cover much in the way of Bart's life since the Brawl for All. Uh, I know that a few days after WWE invited him back, to be part of that they did a battle royal on the 15th anniversary of raw show in december of 2007 uh it was a few days after that show uh when he was in the battle royal that one of his sons michael and i remember reading about this at the time uh this was only about a month or so after i started the sound off his son was hanging out with his friend the friend was cleaning his gun I guess his friend was cleaning his 22 caliber rifle and the gun went off accidentally and it shot Michael in the head. Uh, and his son was in the hospital for about five days and ultimately, you know, five days later he passed away. So I, I cannot imagine being a parent and going through something like that, you know, just losing a child in general, let alone, I mean, to, to lose them in that way. Uh, I haven't heard much about Bart since then until this special. Uh, I guess now he's an electrician. He was an electrician before he even got into WWE. His father was an electrician. He had followed his father into the family uh, business or the family trade. Got into wrestling. And so when he retired, he went back to working as an electrician. I guess that's what he's been doing ever since. Uh, they also found time at the end of the episode to cover the stuff with Draws and his injury. And if you remember on the New Jack special, they had sat down with D'Lo Brown. So I guess when they sat down with D'Lo, they decided to ask him about the draws stuff as well. So we got comments from D'Lo as well about what happened. That's another one of those just terrible, sad stories, you know, that you just wish never would have happened. A total freak accident. Uh, it was another year or so, uh, a little over a year after the Brawl for All, that Draws wrestled before he got hurt. 
and they talked about the incident. It was at, it was here in New York. It was at the Nassau Coliseum. I thankfully was not at the show that night. Um, it was well. Let's see. This was this would have been October of ninety nine, which is strange because I no, I wasn't at that show. No, I'm thinking it was a year earlier, October ninety eight. It was a few days after my birthday. October 98, they were at the Coliseum for Monday Night Raw. I was at that show. That was the night the big boss man came back and Stone Cold filled up Mr. McMahon's Corvette with cement, as Jim Ross said. So anyway, this is a year after that. They were back at the Nassau Coliseum for a, I believe, SmackDown taping. And it was a dark match, so it never aired on TV. I'm sure they have the footage in their vault, probably marked, you know, do not destroy, do not... It's the same thing with the Owen Hart stuff. I'm guessing for insurance purposes, it's labeled do not destroy, uh, do not air, do not view. So I'm sure they must have the footage in their vault somewhere. But they were going for a powerbomb. D'Lo was going to lift up draws for a powerbomb. D'Lo had that running powerbomb that he did. I don't know if it was going to be the running powerbomb or not. Something happened. Someone slipped. They don't blame each other. It was a total freak thing. They fell forward. And Draz said that he heard two cracks. As soon as he landed on the back of his neck, he knew. He goes, oh shit, I broke my neck. And he couldn't feel anything. And Delo's he's telling Delo. Delo's like, stop joking, man. He goes, no, I can't. I can't move. I can't feel anything. And they had still photos from that night of him just laid out prone in the ring. You know, being tended to, being placed on a backboard. And, you know, Draz called D'Lo a good guy. He said, look, we've talked since then. He's a good guy. I wish him all the best. He goes, I'm still alive. He goes, I'm still alive and kicking. And then he caught himself. <laughs> he said, well, I'm not kicking. Uh, but he still gets to hunt and he still gets to do all the things that he loves to do. And and this is the part, I, I think, where Jim Cornette shined the most. If there was a part of this special where Jim Cornette shined and got very emotional, Got his eyes welled up, got all red. He said, you know, Draz is still paralyzed and it's 20 years later. And he's still paralyzed in a wheelchair. Things happen in this business and it's not ballet. And that's why it especially angers me, he says, when people diminish it. One move and he's in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. So don't tell me that wrestling is a bunch of bullshit just some of the ways that people have gotten into it, treat it, is bullshit. And again, he had tears in his eyes as he was saying this. He actually came across at that part like a, like a rational human being who is being honest about the way he feels about pro wrestling. Uh, Russo, they show him in his uh, living room watching back the Brawl for All finals with Bart and Bradshaw. And he's wincing, oh my god, ah, he goes, you know, he feels bad now watching it back, and he says, I really should have been thinking that these guys are out of their element, and everything that we know today about concussions, no way would I ever propose this idea again. And so that was the episode, and I, I do want to address this notion that I sometimes hear, that the Brawl for All killed careers, it was a, it was... This big career killer. It did cause unnecessary injuries. But really, how many careers did it kill outside of Dr. Death? It didn't kill Bart Gunn. WWE killed Bart Gunn. Brawl for All gave Bart Gunn the platform to be elevated. And WWE does not always react very well when guys that they have no plans for end up getting themselves over or getting over on their own. WWE instead chose to bury him out of sheer pettiness. They knew what they were doing when they made that Butterbean fight. You can never convince me otherwise. Butterbean knew it, <laughs> and anybody watching knew it. They knew exactly how that fight was going to go. Bradshaw, he got knocked out, but he went on to become a world champion and a Hall of Famer. Godfather, he got even bigger. He became an even bigger star in 99. Bob Holly, he became a bigger star as well. We didn't get the hardcore Holly stuff, you know, and the stuff with him and Crash and, you know, him as the hardcore champion until the following year. So he became a bigger name. You know, it's guys like Savio and Scorpio, you know, they weren't doing much anyway by that point. They were on their way out. Draz had his accident, but that was completely unrelated to the Brawl for All. Brackus, he sucked. 
He wasn't going anywhere but out the exit door. I hear some people say it was a career killer. But really, outside of Dr. Death, it didn't kill any careers, but it did hurt a lot of people, and it took them off of you know television for a while, and it made wrestling look dumb, because here you have a tournament full of mostly mid-carders. And this is what I never understood about this. You have this tournament. Look at the names who were in this. All due respect to the guys in the tournament, okay? Bart Gunn, Savio Vega, Bradshaw, you know, Draws, Brackus, who hadn't even really wrestled two matches on TV. All, think of all the names in this tournament, right? It's all mid-card guys. You have this tournament full of mostly, if not entirely, mid-card talent who were positioned as the baddest of the bad. Real tough guys. Well then, what does that make everybody else on your roster? If, if Bart Gunn and Bradshaw and Bob Holly are all such badasses, then how come they're jerking the curtain? And they're not the ones headlining shows. You're basically saying all this other stuff is fake. Now we're going to give you the real stuff. And then to send the winner, the man who knocked out Dr. Death and knocked out Bradshaw, to send him to his doom against Butterbean, to send one of your own men in there against a trained fighter and have that fighter embarrass your own guy in less than 30 seconds. How is that supposed to get the WWF over? It doesn't. It doesn't. It tells people that it's a bunch of wannabe tough guys play fighting who can't hang with real fighters. That's what people are going to think. So the whole idea was dumb from the moment that it was conceived. It didn't benefit WWE in any measurable way. It didn't make them any money. It got a lot of people hurt. And it elevated absolutely no one. Not a single person. The one man it could have elevated, it didn't. Because he sat at home and they wasted any potential that he may have had. Bart Gunn was never going to be a main eventer. No matter how many men he knocked out. He was, never, he was not on the level of Stone Cold or The Rock or The Undertaker or any of those guys. He was not an elite performer. No amount of knockouts was going to change that. But he could have been a solid mid-card guy on that roster. He could have become a gatekeeper. You know, they, they elevated no one. It was a complete waste of time. You want to blame Vince Russo? Go right ahead. Blame Vince Russo. But if you're going to blame Vince Russo, you have to blame Vince McMahon every bit as much. He greenlit the idea. He approved it. He had the power to, to end it after the first week. They had a disaster of a first week. All Vince McMahon had to do was go, you know what, there's a bad idea, and put the kibosh on the whole thing. That's what he did with WCW. We had Booker T and Buff Bagwell, which turned out to be a, a disaster. And they actually had plans in place to run WCW as its, separate, its own separate entity. They were going to give the Monday Night Raw slot to WCW. One match, one bad main event is all it took for Vince McMahon to blow the whole thing up and change his mind. You mean to tell me he watched this and couldn't have put his foot down after the first week and said, we're not doing this. He liked it. That's why he stuck with it. He liked it. He liked it so much that years later, according to one of their former writers who tweeted about it this week, this guy, John uh, Pier Marini, he claimed that in 2009 or 2010, he was on the writing team. Vince McMahon wanted to do another Brawl for All. This time he wanted to do it with the guys that were competing on NXT when NXT used to be this uh, competition show. That may have been the Wade Barrett season. He had to be talked out of doing it. He says that the uh, conversation started and ended in that one production meeting, and thankfully they were able to talk Vince McMahon out of doing it. Not only do you have to blame... Vince McMahon, but I'll even defend Vince Russo a little bit on this because his job was to come up with ideas and pitch them to Vince McMahon. And the reason that the McMahon-Russo combo worked as well as it did, we've heard this for what, 20 years now, 25 years now we've heard this, right? It worked because Vince McMahon acted as a filter for Russo's ideas. So if Russo had a bad idea, Vince McMahon would reject it. Or if Vince Russo had a good idea, but maybe he took it too far, Vince McMahon would kind of rein him back in. For years, we have been told this. Meanwhile, how many dumb ideas has Vince McMahon had in the last 21 years since Vince Russo left his company? A lot. Maybe Vince McMahon is the one that needs the filter. Russo's job was to come up with ideas. 
ideas that he thought would get ratings and would make, you know, as he said, all the college frat boys put USA Network on and not want to change the channel. You know, Vince Russo is hardly a wrestling purist, right? He doesn't give a shit about the kind of wrestling that Jim Ross and Jim Cornette grew up watching. He was going for shock value. He was going for sex appeal. He wanted to lure in the teenage boys. Let me rephrase that because that, that, <laughs> that just sounds wrong. He wanted more teenage boys to watch the show. He wanted more college kids to watch the show. In his mind, that's what his job was. That's what he was hired to do. If Jim Cornette wants to threaten violence against Vince Russo and Vince Russo's wife and Vince Russo's children because he felt that Russo somehow betrayed his beloved wrestling business, then he should have called Vince McMahon out for the same thing. He should have called Vince McMahon up on the phone and did the same exact thing. He could have threatened to go after him and Linda and Shane and Stephanie, but he didn't do it. Why? Because he wanted to protect his job. And Russo made for an easy target. And I'm no Russo defender, as you know. I think Russo made a lot of money for himself working for WCW, working for TNA, playing off this reputation as some kind of great television mind who was going to be the savior of wrestling, and he got exposed. When he left WWE, he got exposed. He parlayed three or four big years of success with some of the biggest names in wrestling in the 90s into another 15 years, off and on, that exposed him badly. One of the biggest con artists in a business full of con artists. But when he came to Vince McMahon with this idea, McMahon should have had enough sense to say, what are you, out of your fucking mind? These men aren't pro fighters. They're going to get exposed. They're going to get hurt. We can't afford to have all these injured wrestlers sitting at home not working. Wrestlers are wrestlers. They are not professional fighters. Now, some of them have gone on to become professional fighters. Some professional fighters end up becoming pro wrestlers. But aside from that, precious few. Wrestlers are wrestlers. They are not pro fighters. You know, the uh, Spin Doctors, they had a popular song in the 90s called Two Princes. Okay, well, here you've got two Vinces to blame for this, not one. You cannot blame Vince Russo without also blaming Vince McMahon.